characters who have reached a level of power that sets them high above the ordinary populace and make them special even among adventurers. Creating effects that were previously impossible and confronting threats to whole regions and continents, the fate of the world or even the fundamental order of the multiverse might hang in the balance, and it might fail jumping over a log. Ronald the Rules Lawyer. In Dungeons & Dragons history, throughout all of its editions, it has been a level-based system, and as you leveled up, your numbers got bigger. In 2012, they started designing the fifth edition of the game. The project was then called D&D Next, and they put out this article outlining what they called bounded accuracy, where the numbers do not necessarily go up as you level up. This had admirable goals and remains popular to this day among many dungeon masters. I remember reading this article at the time and being impressed by it. I had been GMing Pathfinder 1st Edition based on D&D 3rd Edition for a few years, and I had seen the problems that Bounded Accuracy sought to solve. And so I had a positive impression of Bounded Accuracy for many years, including in 2018 when the playtest for Pathfinder 2nd Edition came out and it added your entire level to every major statistic of yours. And I remember being ambivalent about that. In fact, I'm sharing on the screen a post I put in the Paizo forums in my former iteration, The Rot Grub where I shared that I initially hated the idea of adding your level to everything, and I was still ambivalent about adding your entire level to your statistics. Needless to say, I've been won over since. D&D 5th Edition came out with bounded accuracy, seeking to accomplish a set of things in that article which we're about to go over, and made a set of promises that I don't think it delivered on. And I'm reminded of a very cool museum that I went to as a kid in San Francisco called the Exploratorium, which had this illusion. It looked like you could touch this metal coil. It looked completely three-dimensional, but when you reached out and tried to touch it, it wasn't there. And I think that it's a good analogy to bounded accuracy. It promises to do a set of things. It looks like there are no problems with it. However, I think it's illusory in two ways. I think that the way it's implemented by the designers is sloppy, and also it creates some problems that are not intended or not desirable for many tables. Now, don't get me wrong when watching this video. I am not saying that a system that has big numbers as you level up is objectively better, though you might get that impression because I'm gonna have a long list of negative things to say about bounded accuracy. That, that's mainly because I'm thorough to a fault, and if you followed my channel, you will know that. There are reasons why you would want to have player characters and monsters bonuses within a relatively narrow band, but I think D&D 5th Edition's implementation of bounded accuracy is lacking, and also that it leads to consequences that are not compatible with a game that advertises itself as a zero-to-hero heroic fantasy. I think that how it implements bounded accuracy has been at the root of a number of common complaints about D&D 5th edition from the community. And I think after 10 years of experience with the system, one would think that the designers should revisit it or at least patch it. But there's no indication in the current process of designing the next edition that they plan to do anything of the kind. First, let me introduce myself. I am Ronald the Rules Lawyer. I am a lawyer who has been GMing Pathfinder 1st Edition, 2nd Edition, D&D 5th Edition, and Starfinder since 2010. And I also ran an after-school middle school program. And I mostly run Pathfinder 2nd Edition. It's my preferred edition. But I've also been doing videos of covering Dungeons and & Dragons and also, more recently, the history of D&D and Pathfinder. If you haven't yet, support my Patreon. It allows me to continue making videos. I actually don't make money as a lawyer. Uh, look at the video that has the thumbnail on the screen if you want to know more. And you also get early access to many of my videos and get access to exclusive content. And so that's the backdrop for this article, which opens by explaining what bounded accuracy is. It says, the basic premise behind the bounded accuracy system is simple. We make no assumptions on the DM side of the game that the player's attack and spell accuracy, or their defenses, increase as a result of gaining levels. Instead, we represent the difference in characters of various levels primarily through their hit points, the amount of damage they deal, and the various new abilities they have gained. Characters can fight tougher monsters not because they can finally hit them, 
but because their damage is sufficient to take a significant chunk out of the monster's hit points. Likewise, the character can now stand up to a few hits from that monster without being killed easily, thanks to the character's increased hit points. Furthermore, gaining levels grants the characters new capabilities, which go much farther toward making your character feel different than simple numerical increases. Now, that all sounds perfectly reasonable. You no longer have situations where someone's bonus is so high that rolling the d20 is meaningless and has no suspense, or you have no chance to succeed at something because the target number is so high. I'll show the Pathfinder 1st Edition Ancient Red Dragon, which had an AC of 38. Many characters would not be able to touch it. And it also had an attack bonus of plus 35. It would automatically hit many creatures. Now, with bounded accuracy, that dragon can be just as easy to hit as, say, an ogre. Its greater toughness will be represented by how many more hit points it has. At the same time, it has no greater chance to hit you than that ogre, but its greater strength is represented by doing a lot more damage. The article then goes over why this is good for the game, and I will now summarize their arguments. The goals of bounded accuracy include removing the pressure on the dungeon master to have to escalate the math as the players level up. It improves realism to not have to present the party with ever stronger doors to break down or ever stronger monsters to encounter. Town guards don't suddenly get tougher because the party is leveled up either. And because they stay consistent over time, the party, as it gets better at things, can feel a sense of progression as they are better able to overcome these static numbers. Lower level or lower CR monsters can stay relevant. The article says that the DM's monster roster expands, never contracts. In unbounded systems, those goblins that you face at level 1 will become irrelevant at some point because their stats are not high enough to be able to even hit the party's uh, characters. But in a bounded accuracy system, the lower level monsters continue to be useful to the DM just in greater numbers. And it gives an example of a first level party handling four goblins at a time and a fifth level party handling 12 of them. And we assume that as they continue to level up, you would just give a greater number of goblins. Another benefit is avoiding the feeling of a treadmill of advancing but staying in place. In unbounded systems, Leveling up increased your numbers, and so did the monster's numbers. And in fact, there was also a pressure to improve your gear so that you get what were called the big six in third edition D&D and first edition Pathfinder, having pluses to your weapons, to your armor, to your shield, so that you could keep up with the math. Now, the article argues, getting a plus one to something actually means you are better at something. Because the numbers are fixed and static, that plus one to your sword will actually increase your likelihood of hitting monsters. Bounded accuracy also allows non-specialists to participate in scenes. Basically, DMs felt pressured to escalate the math to challenge the specialist in the party whose number advanced in unbounded systems, but that had the effect of icing out those who were not specializing and boosting up their numbers to the wazoo. Bounded accuracy would also make the system easier to adjudicate, easier to improvise the difficulty numbers or DCs of various challenges. Because the numbers are not escalating wildly, after a short period of DMing, DMs should gain a clear sense of how to assign DCs to various tasks. A DC of 15 is a mildly difficult check, and the DM can start to associate these values with in-world difficulties. So after some time, you can say with confidence what the DC number is of balancing across a rickety bridge with breaking planks. The DM would also not be saddled down by the fact that somewhere in the rulebooks, the DC of a task is codified. You can avoid a situation where a player rolls a 17 and knows that that's enough to break down an iron-bound wooden door and objects if the DM says it doesn't succeed. Bounded accuracy also allows for more kinds of encounters and adventures, and it gives a couple of examples, one of them being you are facing a dragon that's terrorizing the countryside, you can rally the town to your side and outfit the guards with bows and arrows. 
and this cuts both ways. Hordes of Oryx can challenge a higher level party. And I'll say that all of this was part of 5th edition's effort to bring back everybody who had been pushed away by Dungeons and Dragons over the previous several years with 4th edition. It was to invite everyone who liked all the previous editions back and say that this was a returning to its roots. In a way to roll back from how rules dense and crunchy and codified 3rd and 4th edition of D&D were, and to say, well, you the DM are empowered to make things up as you go along, and you'll now have more freedom to just tell a story, and not be saddled by all this math that's getting in the way, and also some power gaming players who are purposefully breaking the math and busting your encounters. To which I will next say that D&D 5th edition only superficially harkens back to older editions of the game. And this will be surprising to some. It was clear from the article that they wanted to make it so that DMs could have a more naturalistic approach to designing dungeons and wilderness areas, that you don't have to scale everything to the party's level because level has been taken out of the equation. And a lot of official modules for 5th edition are, first of all, republications of older modules and revamping of them, but also a lot of them feature sandbox areas where you could walk into an encounter that's much stronger than your party or much weaker. The article's example of rallying the town guard to take on the dragon suggests this more sandbox-like play where you can take on things that are much higher level than you that you can't do in a straight-up fight, but you can find creative ways to take on. So 5th edition has the appearance of revitalizing this old school style of play, but I think it's important to separate bounded accuracy from that because in fact old school D&D did not have this at all. D&D 5th edition is the outlier in this regard. What you're looking at is the matrix in original Dungeons and Dragons from 1974 where your level advancement as a fighting man, as they were then called, was kind of in lockstep with your greater accuracy to hit creatures. This was further codified in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in the Dungeon Master's Guide in 1979, where basically you added your level to your attacks. If you look at this chart and did what many people did, allowed every level up to increase the fighter's accuracy. Another part of the mythology around D&D 5th edition is that, well, part of Bounded Accuracy's implementation was to make magic items rarer. And that's supposed to harken back to older editions of D&D where you did not have magic marks and magic items were truly a find. But in older D&D, you were expected to find magic items that improved your basic math and you found them quite often, in fact, in Keep on the Borderlands, perhaps the most played module of all time, which was included in every starter box in D&D for many years, the module awarded these magic items, and there's a lot of them, to player characters in an adventure that spanned levels 1 through 3, and that includes two suits of plate mail plus 1 and a sword plus 2. Alright, so how does 5th edition implement bounded accuracy? Well, the basics are these. First, it lowers the automatic increase to your statistics that you gain from leveling up. Instead of 3rd edition fighters effectively adding their level to their accuracy, every class starts with a proficiency bonus of plus 2 at level 1, which only goes up to plus 6. It only increases by 4 over the course of the 20 levels. Also, ability scores like Strength, Dexterity, Charisma cannot go any higher than 20, so the highest modifier you can get from your ability score is plus 5. There are a few ways to improve your armor class. In fact, Making armor class predictable was one of the goals that they had, according to the article. Also, the game is balanced, designs its monsters and challenges around the assumption that the party does not have any magic items. This is borne out by the Dungeon Master's Guide section on creating monsters, which has this chart that shows the expected statistics for creatures of various challenge ratings. And it has save DCs of monster special abilities, and it increases pretty much in lockstep. You can see it goes up by one at fourth level when classes get an ability boost, and again at fifth level when their proficiency bonus increases. 
Next, D&D 5th Edition reduces the sheer number of bonuses that you can add to your statistics, which was kind of out of control in 3rd Edition and to some extent 4th Edition and Pathfinder 1st Edition. Instead of lots of plus ones and plus threes everywhere, a lot of these get folded into the advantage and disadvantage system. Advantage does not stack with itself. There are definite positive effects with how D&D 5th edition implemented bounded accuracy, not the least of which is reducing the sheer number of floating modifiers that you had to track in combat, and also removing the phenomenon of many players building their character and winning at character creation because they have a plus 40 in thievery or stealth, for example. Bounded accuracy made it so that, to some extent, your decisions in combat are as important, if not more, than the ones you made at character creation or advancement. However, bounded accuracy in D&D 5th edition makes promises it does not deliver on and has consequences that many tables won't like. One promise is that the math is actually not bounded in a number of ways. First, it doesn't seem to follow a system. The Dungeon Master's Guide has this chart of monster statistics. The attack bonuses go up gradually, and armor class goes up kind of at the same rate, and then caps at 19. It stops increasing at 19. This all looks fine and good. The problem is that D&D 5th edition does not follow this chart. And there's an excellent article uh, by Blog of Holding that is called The 5e Monster Creation Guidelines Are Wrong. And in it, they did a meta-analysis of the monsters in the Monster Manual and compared their statistics to what the chart we just looked at recommends. The armor class of monsters do not cap at 19, they go above 19. Hit points are substantially lower than what's in that chart. And I think this is an occasion to return to this chart, which I would argue has a flaw because the attack bonuses of monsters continue to escalate while defenses don't. The fact that for player characters and monsters, armor class is not affected by the proficiency bonus while other stats are, destabilizes the system and leads to unpredictable and perhaps undesired results. And the monsters in the monster manual outpace even that and get more accurate compared to the static armor class of player characters. And that is why many players feel like they fall behind, because they do uh, monster accuracy. We know from the article that the designers intended the game to be balanced around the party not having magic items. But this discrepancy that I just pointed out means that a dungeon master would be remiss not to give magic armor and magic shields especially to frontliner characters who are going to be hit by those ancient red dragons, that that's a necessary part of advancement in 5e. The article also tested out whether the people who designed the monsters in the monster manual adhered to the DMG's guidelines for things like give more hit points if it, the monster has a lower armor class and vice versa. They found no correlation uh, and adherence to their own guidelines there. Similarly, there was no difference at all between the damage output of beefy and glass-jawed monsters. Whatever system produced this chart, they're not following it. And it's not clear, in fact, the article's analysis suggests that they don't have a system in place of it. And that's also evidenced by the fact that after 10 years, they haven't revised this chart in any way. This deviation from a previous plan is related to the next way in which the math is not bounded in 5e, which is that there is little quality control on bonuses to keep the math within predictable parameters. With bounded accuracy, the designers wanted to prevent players from just automatically succeeding by stacking bonuses. The article made clear that they wanted some things to be difficult to achieve off limits so that you had to gain abilities to achieve them. It talks about having to bypass a solid adamantine door encrusted with ancient runes and says that if players have the means of breaking it down, it's because they pursued player options that make that so, not simply a side effect of continuing to adventure or leveling up apparently. Their idea was that you're supposed to, over some time, gain abilities that enable you to eventually bypass that door. But we're about to see that nearly impossible tasks as defined by the game, D 
DC 30 tasks can be achieved by level 1 characters by stacking bonuses. On the one hand, 5th edition reduced the sheer number of things that give you numerical bonuses and folded a lot of the rest into advantage. But advantage is pretty easy to get if you can find the, those ways to do it. And also, those bonuses that you can find, they can stack with each other without limit. Let's begin with an attack roll. A first level fighter makes a longbow attack. That fighter will have a dexterity of plus 3, a proficiency bonus of plus 2, and they have the archery fighting style, which gives them another plus 2. If there is a peace domain cleric in the party, that cleric can cast Bless, adding a d4, and use their emboldening bond ability and add another d4. At level 1, this cleric can give both of these bonuses for an entire combat two times per day, and that's a good number of times per day, and together they're already giving the archer a plus 12 bonus to attack. If they have a bard in the party, that bard can add another d6 with bardic inspiration. And when that fighter reaches level 3, and let's say they become a battle master, they can add a superiority die and use precision attack to add another d8. Now a level 3 fighter's bonus is plus 20. And by rules as written, there is a number of ways to get advantage on these plus 20 attack rolls. You can use inspiration. Another character or creature can use the help action, including the owl familiar, the popular owl familiar. Now let's look at skill checks. Let's say we have a rogue facing a nearly impossible lock made by a legendary locksmith and is trying to pick it. This is a level 1 rogue who has Custom Lineage, the popular option from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that gives you a feat at level 1, who takes the Skill Expert feat, letting them boost their Dexterity to plus 4. They also have the Expertise Class feature, letting them have a plus 4 in proficiency at, with Thieves' Tools, and the Bard is singing while they're picking this lock, so add a d6, and the Cleric is casting Guidance, adding a d4. Meanwhile, the Peace Domain is what they have, and they're using Emboldening Bond, and this together adds to a plus 16.5 bonus. When you chart it out, that level 1 character has a 37.5% chance of succeeding at this nearly impossible lock. If the rogue has advantage, which is not that hard to get, this chance increases to 59.6%. Now, there's the argument that this is working as intended. It's achieving a goal from the article. Your statistic on your piece of paper is not winning the day. It is the actions you take, the decisions you make, that's creating this bonus that's so high. However, some of these things were so basic and repeatable that this task is arguably too easy. Succeeding at tasks is reduced, in the final analysis often, to conserving your resources for the right time of day. And if you run out of such a resource, make a long rest. Some of these bonuses that you get don't even need a daily resource. And this leads to the common complaint that many dungeon masters have that they have trouble challenging their players. And that includes the adventuring day problem, the pressure to have encounter after encounter or challenge after challenge within a single day in order to use the party's resources and make failure even possible. But also, 5e's lack of controlling its bonuses is not limited to those that proc off of actions. It also exists in passive bonuses that you can get as well. Here's the Arcane Grimoire. It's a magic item from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This is only an uncommon magic item, the plus one version, and it gives that plus one to spell attack rolls and saving throw DCs of wizard spells. There's another item called Amulet of the Devout, which operates much in the same way. And you would think from the name that it is limited to cleric spells, but actually it's not. It's a bonus to spell attack rolls. And it does require attunement by a cleric or a paladin, but a caster can fix that with a level dip. If one runs these rules as written, you can get two uncommon items that give you a collective plus two to your spell attack rolls and DCs. And it doesn't stop there. There are plus three versions of each. This stacking of bonuses undermines the math of the game. Now let's compare this to Pathfinder 2nd Edition, which actually controls its math. And 
yes, I'm a Pathfinder 2E fan. Um, I'm just focused on Pathfinder 2E in this video because it's what I'm most familiar with. I'm sure that there are other systems that also have quality control when it comes to their math that I'm less familiar with. But yeah, uh, Pathfinder bounds its math, which is a surprising statement because its bonuses can get really big. It has a variant rule that kind of accomplishes what bounded accuracy is trying to get called proficiency without level. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. Basically, you see a level 16 creature. All of its statistics include the number 16 in it. Subtract 16 from it. On Archives of Nethys, all of the monsters in Pathfinder are available for free. You can remove level easily by clicking the Proficiency Without Level link above each monster's stats, and it subtracts the level for you. Compare these stats of a level 10 young red dragon to those of a level 19 ancient red dragon. You'll see that even with level subtracted, there is some significant measurable increase in all of these stats. D&D 5th edition has this gradual increase with levels. Also, the difference is that Pathfinder's chart that it uses to build its creature statistics by level, it's actually adhered to. Also, the math is more stable. You can't add plus 10 to a check willy-nilly. There are much smaller bonuses that you get, and they are typed. There's only two different types of bonuses that you can add to a check that can change in the middle of a battle, usually. Those are status bonuses and circumstance bonuses. A cleric casting the bless spell gives a status bonus to attack rolls, and a bard giving inspiration gives a plus one status bonus to attack rolls. They don't combine. This variant also accomplishes what 5e is trying to do with bounded accuracy, which is empower the GM to use monsters of a wide variety of levels against a given party. You can use monsters as low as seven levels beneath the party's level and up to seven levels above. You can also count on these XP totals to measure the threat level of the creatures for a variety of reasons, one of which is that uh, in Pathfinder the math is actually controlled and bounded. Another way 5th edition's implementation of bounded accuracy falls short of its goals is its all-or-nothing proficiency system, which leads to undesirable math as you get to higher levels. One of the problems bounded accuracy was supposed to solve was to remove situations where you're going to pretty much auto-succeed or auto-fail because your bonus was so high or so low. If you want your in-game decisions to matter, you want there to be a fair chance of success or failure on roles that players can affect. This was an issue in 3rd edition D&D and also Pathfinder 1st edition. Every class had good saves and bad saves. The fighter had a good fortitude save and everything else was bad. And this meant that by the time they were level 20, there was a gap of 6 between the two saving throws in the bonuses they got from being a fighter. Fifth edition kept the same gap between good and bad saving throws with its proficiency system. The proficiency bonus goes up to plus six, and when you're not proficient in something, you get a plus zero. Also, for saving throws, you have six of them, one for each of your ability scores. So every class is going to fall behind on those saving throws they're not proficient in. And meanwhile, the save DCs of monster special abilities continue to go up and up as you deal with higher CR monsters. One particularly stark example is the Frightful Presence ability of many dragons. The Ancient Red Dragon, which is challenge rating 24, makes creatures frightened who are within 120 feet who fail on a DC 21 wisdom saving throw. And the frightened condition is very debilitating. They have disadvantage on attack rolls against the creature and they cannot willingly move closer to it. Also affecting your saving throw bonus is your ability score associated with that save. So a level 20 cleric may have a wisdom saving throw of plus 11 to resist this dragon's frightful presence. However, a level 20 fighter may have a plus zero and have zero chance of succeeding on the saving throw. Not even a natural 20 lets you succeed on this save according to 5e's rules. And 5th edition is unique in the history of D&D in tying your saving throws to each of your six ability scores. And every class makes you proficient in only two of those six saving throws. So most of your saving throws you're gonna be very bad at at higher levels. Third and fourth edition reduced this to fortitude, reflex, and will, which is a fewer number of bases you have to cover. And also arguably more intuitive. 
Fortitude has to do with physical toughness. Reflex is dodging, getting out of the way. Will is mental defenses. It's well known in 5e that some of these saving throws are more used than others, and you can be surprised sometimes by what will be targeted, which can feel very bad when you have some weak saving throws, which you will. For example, let's say a level 20 fighter is on an extra planar adventure and has invested in their wisdom uh, and maybe even taken a feat to be proficient in their wisdom saving throw to avoid things like Dragon's Frightful Presence ability. However, an enemy spellcaster may cast Banishment on that fighter, which calls for a Charisma saving throw, and that fighter may have a minus one modifier on their saving throw. When they fail, they are banished to their home plane, and cannot come back. And also, it's only a fourth level spell. A relatively low threat spellcaster can banish this high level fighter back home. Now, some will say, well, this makes sense. Charisma is your willpower. But I don't know, why not just merge wisdom and charisma together somehow, which is what fourth edition did. Your higher stat between wisdom and charisma determined your bonus for your will saving throw. And we remember from the Bounded Accuracy article that a goal of the designers was to not make it so that just your stats on your character sheet determined your success or failure. It was your decisions in-game. And here we have your stats on your character sheet determining whether you pretty much fail. This, of course, extends to monsters, which have very good saving throws and very bad saving throws. A notorious example is the legendary Tarrasque, a challenge rating 30 monster, which only the most legendary characters, you would think, can take down. However, it has a dexterity saving throw of only plus zero. So if you have enough spellcasters to get past its legendary resistance, who will cast the web spell, you can pretty much tie the Tarrasque to the ground. And Restrained is a very strong debuff. It cannot move, it has disadvantage on attacks, all attacks against it have advantage, and it gets disadvantage on future dexterity saving throws. Okay, sure, it has advantage on saving throws against spells, but let's take a typical level 17 caster who has a DC of 19. That Tarrasque is almost certainly going to fail because they need to roll a natural 19. And if that spellcaster has a couple of our uncommon magic items that we saw earlier, to boost their DC, then the Tarrasque has zero chance of succeeding on a saving throw. These big gaps in the math are just not necessary. Sure, it can do a strength check to try to bust out, but that uses its only action, and also, because of bounded accuracy, its strength bonus is only plus 10, and so it has only a 50-50 chance of breaking out. Another what I would call a downside, which leads to a result not desired by many tables, is that level 1 characters can do nearly impossible things in D&D. We see that the designers intended this. The article shows a more lax attitude towards player characters breaking the math, and they say as much. It says, we, the designers, make no assumptions on the DM side of the game about increased accuracy and defenses. This does not mean that the players do not gain bonuses to accuracy and defenses. In addition to the passive math improvements that come with adventuring, the player characters can, from the get-go, do spells and tactics that vastly bend the math in the party's favor. Players can then do what the game classifies as nearly impossible tasks. Nearly impossible is a DC of 30, and it's the highest DC that the game contemplates happening. Now, some tables may be fine with players being able to make decisions to secure a win. However, it does introduce two problems, which I'll now describe. First, a dungeon master has a hard time challenging a party that uses tools like these, and as they level up, they get more tools of this nature, making it harder and harder to challenge them. Second, this exacerbates a complaint that many 5e players have that they don't really feel the significance of leveling up. Level 20 characters can fail at things that level 1 characters can succeed at. Here are the rules for jumping. The default rule is that to clear a low obstacle that is no taller than a quarter of the jump's distance, you need to succeed on a DC 10 athletics check. Now, if you're a level 20 rogue in this game with a 10 strength, that means you have a 50-50 chance to fail at jumping over a 2 or 3 foot high obstacle. This, to some people, might look like a mistake. However, the Dungeon Master's Guide spells out that this is exactly what they intended. This is from page 238 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. They say that a DC 30 check is nearly impossible for most, most low-level characters. So for others, it's not nearly impossible. Meanwhile, a 20th-level character with proficiency 
and a relevant ability score of 20 still needs a 19 or 20 on the die roll to succeed at that task. It then goes on to say that this is good for verisimilitude, uh, the believability of it within the fantasy world. An iron banded door with a DC of 17 is just as tough to break down at 20th level as it was at first, and it might still be a challenge for a party consisting of heroes without great strength scores. But this violates what many people expect. Many people think that when they're 20th level that they're much better at things than they were before. They want to be badass by that time. And this counters one of the stated goals in the article, which said that when you get better at something, it means you actually get better at something. Now, granted, they're targeting specifically getting better because you are leveling up, you are adventuring. However, by removing that upward progression, that means that you hardly get better. And there's a pretty good Reddit post I found, it's up on the screen, that says that bounded accuracy can hinder verisimilitude in places, where a 20th level fighter with maximum strength of 20 can have a 15% chance of failing at a DC 15 athletics check. They write, that actually seems more outrageous to me, especially since this is the guy with enough HP to fall off a clip and get back up a few times per day. One more example is that a 15th level fighter is going to be barely better than a 5th level fighter at athletics checks. And this gets exacerbated because the system gives you very few ways to improve your skills. I also would challenge the assumption in the article that people want the math to be flat in terms of accuracy and defenses. All right, sure, they want challenges in the environment like busting down an iron banded door to have the same number at higher levels as at lower levels, which by the way does not require bounded accuracy to make that true. <laughs> but anyway, they extend the logic to the combat ability of higher level monsters like dragons and titans. They argue that it's easier to understand armor classes, the number you need to roll to hit something, if it stays static even as you level up. They say it right in the article. Under the bounded accuracy system, a DM can describe a hobgoblin wearing chainmail, and no matter what the level of the characters, a player can reasonably guess that the hobgoblin's AC is around 15. The description of the world matches up to mechanical expectations, and eventually players will see chainmail or leather armor or plate mail in-game and have an instinctive response to how tough things are. This gets reflected in D&D's armor chart. You can see that 18 is the armor class you get wearing plate mail armor, and you see that 18 is the upper end of how high your AC can be as a player character. This means that a level 5 fighter wearing plate mail is just as easy to hit as a level 15 fighter. However, I think many players expect that higher level creatures are just better at fighting, and the designers are a bit disdainful towards that idea. This is from the article, they say, Characters can fight tougher monsters, not because they can finally hit them, as if that were a ridiculous idea. But higher level creatures are not just better at withstanding punishment, they're also more skillful at avoiding and negating blows, or delivering them more deftly. And there's a quirk in the monster building guidelines in D&D 5e. Attack bonuses of higher CR creatures continue to scale up, get more and more accurate. Meanwhile, players' armor classes are staying pretty static, and that means that high-level fighters, which will be facing higher CR creatures, let's be real, they will, are going to tend to be hit more and more often. And there's actually a feeling of regression as you level up and face higher-level monsters. Now, this can be countered somewhat if the DM rewards you with magic armor and shields. However, this is a system that's telling those DMs that they're not really required. And that, by the way, is one of the byproducts of bounded accuracy, telling DMs to be stingy with magic items. But this goes against what has been one of the primary appeals of D&D since the earliest days. Besides leveling up, the other appeal of dungeon delving has historically been that thrill of finding magical items guarded by very jealous and powerful creatures. The Dungeon Master's Guide has DMs placing treasures through random determination. It includes a table where if you start a character at a higher level, even a level 16 character only has two uncommon magic items. Here's the chart from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Major magic items, one example of which is a magical sword, a plus one sword, uh, for a typical adventuring party, you only give two such items to them in their first four levels. Also, you can only attune to three magical items according to the rules. 
But again, people like magical items, and I'm going to show again the list of magical items you find in Keep on the Borderlands, the very popular early D&D module that gave all of these magical items during the first three levels of experience. Another goal of Bounded Accuracy was to prevent low CR monsters from becoming obsolete. However, that's still true to a great extent, at least in how D&D 5th Edition implements it. They outline their goal right here in the article. They say, the DM's monster roster expands, never contracts. As the characters gain levels, the lower level monsters continue to be useful to the DM just in greater numbers. While we might fight only four goblins at a time at first level, we might take on 12 of them at fifth level without breaking a sweat. However, my experience playing D&D 5e was that once you got to tier two play starting with fifth level, the characters get ability that can trivialize low CR monsters. It was an epiphany for me running Tomb of Annihilation and rolling a random encounter with zombies and seeing them deleted by a fireball spell. And definitely by tiers three and four, PCs will have many abilities to simply nope hordes of goblins. In fact, a common piece of advice to 5e DMs is if you think that a encounter is going to pose no challenge to the party, to simply hand wave it and narrate it. And to which I say, if that's true, then bounded accuracy is not doing its job. And the problem was not simply in the numbers. So no, I don't think Bounded Accuracy succeeds at keeping low CR monsters challenging, with a few notable exceptions. The article continues, Since the monsters don't lose the ability to hit the player characters, the DM can continue to increase the number of monsters instead of needing to design or find whole new monsters. And this leads to our next problem, which is that your harder encounters become slogs, and this gets truer and truer as you get into higher levels. Now, I don't think I need to convince anybody that running a battle with 20 goblins is going to be tedious. And forgive me for using my Pathfinder 2e experience consistently and frequently, but it's the one I'm most familiar with. But Pathfinder 2e has a mechanic, and I wouldn't be surprised if other systems do, called troops that emulates large numbers of low-level creatures in a single stat block that the game master can run that challenges a significantly higher level party. While well, 5e is limiting itself to expressing higher challenge by increasing its hit points and not with other tools like increasing armor class. So we have things like the Frost Giant, a monster that is sometimes called a sack of hit points by 5e players and DMs. And that phrase, sack of hit points, is a common complaint against 5e monsters because of this phenomenon. Now, granted, that complaint is directed at some stat blocks that don't have many interesting abilities. But also it's this phenomenon of an armor class that's relatively low. Again, it's our predictable number that the article promised us of 15 for patchwork armor, but they have this huge number of hit points of 138. And you're chipping away at that sack of hit points with every strike you make. And because the AC you have to hit is pretty low and there's so many hit points for you to chip away at, that leads to a slog. But also, and I don't think this is because it's bounded accuracy. I think it's because of how 5e implements it. A stronger creature doing more damage is usually expressed in just having more attacks. So fighters get to do up to nine attacks per round eventually, and other martial characters are just awarded more attacks. And they be resemble more and more the Merolith demon, the six-armed demon that has as many attacks. This high number of attacks actually makes combat more predictable because you're not going to have big swings of luck. The more rolls you make, the more you're going to veer towards an average. And this exacerbates the feeling of a slog. There's less excitement. One of the most common pieces of advice you'll find in videos and articles to make D&D combat less boring is to have players do things that are not dealing damage giving them obstacles in the environment, or giving them alternative goals in the combat. That is a sign that a core premise of bounded accuracy, of expressing greater strength with more hit points, is not winning over tables. Another promise from the bounded accuracy article that I think does not play out in practice is the promise that improvising and adjudicating scenes will become easier. Let's let the article make its case. It says that bounded accuracy makes it easier to DM and easier to adjudicate improvised scenes. After a short period of DMing, DMs should gain a clear sense of how to assign DCs to various tasks. If the DM knows that for most characters, a DC of 15 is a mildly difficult check, 
then the DM starts to associate DC values with in-world difficulties. Thus, when it comes time to improvise, a link has been created between the difficulty of the challenge in the world, balancing as you run across this rickety bridge is pretty tough due to the breaking planks, especially if you're not a nimble character, and the target number. Since those target numbers don't change, the longer a DM runs his or her game, the easier it is going to be to set quick target numbers. Improvise monster attack Megan. Bonus... <laughs> Megan. How difficult tasks are ceases to be a moving target under a bounded accuracy system. This goal is expressed in the DC's chart that we are presented in the DMG. First, I have to give the advice that simply because the party levels up in your campaign does not mean the DM should auto-scale challenges up to their level. In fact, you often want to present the same challenge that was tough before to the party when it gets better at it to give them that sense of progression. Pathfinder 2E is an unbounded system, but it does not presume you auto-scale DCs. Here are a couple of skill actions in the system. Balancing on a wooden beam is going to be a trained task, meaning DC of 15. Whereas balancing on chunks of floor falling in mid-air is going to be legendary or a DC of 40. Climbing a typical tree, DC 15. A smooth surface, DC 40. What's distinctive about 5e's approach is that it does not give you examples. It just gives us the adjectives, nearly impossible. And given the fact that low-level characters, level 1 characters, can accomplish a DC 30 check because of how unbounded bonuses are, are in 5e as we saw earlier, it's not really clear what DC 30 is really representing. It makes it harder for the DM to set DCs because under the hood, the math is not very controlled in the system. You combine this with the fact that high-level adventurers can have very bad saving throws in most of their ability scores, and that means you don't know what DC to assign a killer trap. If you set the dexterity saving throw DC to 20, there are some characters who can make it, but most characters will almost certainly die. Never mind the fact that a DC of 20 on a saving throw is much harder than a DC of 20 for a skill check, because the math underlying them is so different. It's much easier to pile up bonuses on a skill check. Another promise of bounded accuracy was to allow non-specialists to participate. However, that has the side effect of undermining specialists. The article said that they wanted non-specialized characters to easily participate in many scenes. First, I'd say that in 5e, that's only partially true, because let's take a level 11 rogue who has expertise and reliable talent. For a skill that they have a high ability score bonus in, and they have expertise in the skill, they can guarantee a result of 22 or higher. And next, I am actually fine with that, that specialists are really good at something that other people are not. <laughs> and I think that the article overstates the problem. First, the DM does not have to auto-scale challenges to challenge the specialist and leave everybody else out. And if a table wants more players to be able to participate in certain scenes, there are ways to address that. First of all, allowing players to talk out of character to the person who is doing the task is one solution. And also creative uses of skills to aid the main check or to do other things, such as recalling knowledge that could be vital to insert into a conversation that another party member is leading. And ultimately, I think it's fine for specialists to feel like they're really good at something, kind of analogous to high-level characters feeling really awesome. In 5e, the highest natural bonus you can get is a plus 11, plus 6 from your proficiency bonus, and plus 5 from your ability score. And because plus 11 is only about half of a d20, this means that the barbarian can succeed on some intelligence knowledge check, and a low-strength wizard can out-athletics a barbarian. This means that for almost all characters, if you specialize at something, at level 20, you still have a fair chance of failing at a moderate check. Now, sure, I think there'll be an objection here that, well, maybe the DM shouldn't call for a check to begin with in some of these situations. But there are just some situations where you kind of need to allow everybody to roll a check. Let's say everybody under pressure needs to balance across a narrow beam over a chasm to get to the other side. Sure, you can set the DC to 15, but that character who started as a circus performer and now is a master thief 
only has a plus 10 and has a fair chance of failing while somebody in plate armor makes it across. Now, maybe you can hand wave it so that that circus performer thief auto succeeds, but at that point you're fighting the system. Why not just have a system that allows you to have higher bonuses? And my last thing on my list is that verisimilitude suffers under bounded accuracy. We've just gone through the example of how you can't really have some tasks that are beyond the reach of new adventurers, and you can't make it so that some simple tasks cannot be failed by experienced specialists. I'll just take this occasion to use an example from the article. It says that as the player characters level up, that there's no need to make the door they face then a solid adamantine door encrusted with ancient runes to pose a moderate challenge to those characters. Taking the Dungeon Mastery Guide's rules at face value, busting down this door is a DC of 30. But that's something that can be accomplished with a level 1 party. And those same level 1 characters can still insta-die to, say, 15 or 20 points of damage. How do you explain that? By flattening the math, bounded accuracy creates this hard-to-believe world where impossible-sounding things can be done by any new adventurer. I think it just makes sense that in a world that there are tasks that new adventurers simply can't do, like climbing a smooth surface, while somebody who is a master thief who can climb a smooth surface does not have a chance of failing at climbing a rope. All right, some final thoughts. Bounded accuracy accomplishes things that are good for many tables. Tables that want to have a flatter power curve in their world. Characters who are more grounded and not a tier above other mortals who can still be hit by goblins. The article's example, it allows a low-level party to rally a town to their side and take down a fearsome dragon. To which I ask, is this desirable in D&D? For some tables, the answer is yes. But for a significant number of tables, I don't think so. And I think the designers think the answer was yes for the vast majority of tables. First, the usual modern style of play involves high-level characters taking on big threats like ancient dragons on their own in a fight that's challenging but fair for them, in which they take the dragon head-on, a style of game that in the OSR community is often called combat as sport. Many players want to be the big damn heroes, the elite group of adventurers that bring the dragon down. But if that city can be handled by a set of town guards, why involve adventurers at all? For some tables, that challenges their suspension of disbelief. Second, fights that involve many low-level creatures taking on a high-level threat, that fight is either going to be trivialized or devolve into a slog. And third, and most importantly, many people want the zero to hero fantasy. And that's something that D&D embraced from its beginning years. And this was what Caleb Harrington's video is about. Most gamers, I would say, especially people who come from RPGs from video games, want and look forward to that feeling of advancement. They want to have exciting things to look forward to when they level up. And they don't want, when they're level 20, to be challenged by a group of goblins. Bounded accuracy flattens progression. It might seem exciting at first when you reach 5th level that you can take on a CR 10 or higher creature. However, by the time you get to level 10 and take down your first CR 18 creature, there's not much higher you can go. Bounded accuracy, by saying you can do pretty much anything at low levels, means that there's no point at being high level. And similarly, people want magic items. As I said, from D&D's earliest years, it has been one of the main appeals. And bounded accuracy is also behind the common complaint that DMs have that they can't challenge their mid to high level players. But does an unbounded system mean that you can win with math and trivialize the d20 roll? Well, I think it's important to not conflate two different things. Lessening or removing the effect of leveling up is different from controlling the math of your system. 5th edition is bounded in that you cannot get a plus 30 in a skill because you've leveled up and gotten some feats and magic items, but it's unbounded in that you can trivialize tasks even at low level, as we've shown in this video. 
Pathfinder 2E, meanwhile, is unbounded in that you add your level to your statistics if you're trained or better, and you can increase that bonus even further by becoming up to legendary. If you're level 20 and legendary in something, you add a plus 28. That's before your ability score. But it's more bounded in that outside of those things, there are strict limits on how you can modify that stat. There's only a few types of bonuses you can add. You're not able to pile on plus 10 in bonuses this way. And meanwhile, higher level monsters that you encounter, their numbers are scaling up also. The D20 stays relevant at all levels, which was one of the goals of bounded accuracy. Does that mean that an unbounded system feels like a treadmill where players never feel their progression? Well, I would say first that there is a treadmill in an unbounded system and that that's not necessarily bad. Remember that the GM can always and should present lower level tasks to a high level party so they can sense how much better they've gotten. And remember that many players want to do greater things that they couldn't before. They want to face a whole mob of ogres that used to be a difficult single boss before. You just don't want to make the mistake of just presenting larger statistics. You want abilities to scale up also. And I'm just going to show on the screen a level 20 monster from Pathfinder, where if you target a creature, they can switch places with a party member and have the attack target the party member instead. That's just cool. Matt Colville has a couple of videos, one on action-oriented monsters and another on using D&D 4th edition monsters to liven up your 5e combat, in which he emphasizes memorable abilities to convey the fantasy of your creature. And that is what you want to do with high-level creatures. You'll want higher-level monsters to be appropriately more epic and awesome. One of the complaints of 5e is that some monsters just seem like a lower Sierra monster but with more hit points. 5e, by avoiding the treadmill of attack and defense statistics going higher, have replaced it with another treadmill in which hit points go higher. And this treadmill is one that some tables will find actually less interesting. And I think that the problem of presenting ever-escalating challenges in earlier systems can't be separated from the fact that it was kind of harder to just run higher level campaigns, period, in those early systems. The tools were imperfect because the math was not controlled. 3rd edition D&D and Pathfinder 1st edition had both unbounded accuracy and unbounded math, unbounded bonuses. It made encounter balancing difficult, and 4th edition D&D and Pathfinder 2nd edition have accomplished to a great extent making level mean level. And you can point to, say, a DC of 20 and know that a level 1 party will have a difficult time of it, a level 5 party has a good chance of succeeding, and a level 15 party, they're just going to trivialize it. It's nice to have accurate tools so that you can present a fair challenge to a high-level party while always having the option to not scale to their level. D&D, since 2000, and 3rd edition, I would say, has increased the power fantasy, increased the power of characters. And I would say that D&D wanted to walk back from that, and that resulted in bounded accuracy. And one of the things I've always called 5e is the compromise edition. Wizards of the Coast, in its desperation to bring back players who left with 4th edition, wanted to bring back players of all previous editions and all different playstyles under one big tent. And so it has tried to do several things at once, and arguably too many things at once, sometimes things that uh, are kind of at odds with each other. On the one hand, Bounded Accuracy says no to some characters being a cut above others. It wants non-specialists to participate. On the other hand, it promises that you will grow from apprentice adventurers at tier one to becoming characters who have reached a level of power that sets them high above the ordinary populace and make them special even among adventurers. Creating effects that were previously impossible and confronting threats to whole regions and continents. And in Tier 4, the fate of the world or even the fundamental order of the multiverse might hang in the balance, and they might fail jumping over a log. 
It appeals to verisimilitude by saying that even high-level adventurers can be hit by goblin arrows. But in the end, it says there are superheroes and legendary monsters anyway. It just represents them with huge amounts of HP. It tells DMs that they can challenge high-level characters with large numbers of goblins. At the same time, it tells players that they can decimate large numbers of goblins with their increased power. It assumes no magic items, but then designs monsters where whether you have a magic item makes a huge difference in how hard they are. And then leaves it to the DM to decide when to give magic items and to deal with the volatile consequences. D&D 5e is trying to have its cake and eat it too. Wizards of the Coast tries to serve several masters at once, and that's why I say D&D's bounded accuracy is a lie. It doesn't fully carry it through, and what it promises, it doesn't fully deliver on. Bounded accuracy promises balance and order to the system, as if lowering numbers is enough, but there's more work to do than that. It's like the promise that 5e is supposedly rules light. It might appear rules light, at least to some people, but it's actually a rules heavy system. And the impression that it is rules light relies on the DM doing the heavy lifting. For both of these promises, bounded accuracy and being rules light, they kind of each in their own way let Wizards of the Coast off the hook to balance and control their own game. The game can't be broken because all the numbers are within narrow bounds. You can use monsters at any level. You can give magic items at any level. There's no need for guidelines on when to give magic weapons and magic armor, even though it has a huge effect on the difficulty of monsters. Bounded accuracy is like a PR slogan. It promises the DM that they don't have to worry about balance when in fact how 5e implements bounded accuracy makes it significantly harder. It's like a coat of paint. It might have been colorful and vibrant in 2014, but 10 years later, after 10 years of experience, the paint has started to fade. So that's it. <laughs> so in the comments, I would only request that uh, people be kind and respectful to each other because there are, again, legitimate reasons why many tables want and should have a flatter power curve in their games. And also there are people who want that and acknowledge that D&D's implementation could be better. So this video took too long. I'm going to do a shorter video, probably something Pathfinder 2e related for my next one. In the meantime, if you like the video, like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and support my Patreon. You'll get early access to many videos and exclusive content. And if you haven't yet, join my Discord. We are a growing community, almost 5,000 now, where you can talk Pathfinder 2e and other gaming. And also there is a drop in organized play system called Endless Tale Tavern that you can play Pathfinder 2e in. So that's it. I have been Ronald the Rules Lawyer. I'll see you next time. Thank you.